Hello, my name is Dominic Ziegler. I write the Economist's weekly Banyan column on all things to do with Asia. A very warm welcome to you all for this discussion. It's a fishing panel discussion, and it's all about protecting small-scale fisheries. Uh, and they are Sangram Sawant, founder of Pesca Fresh, Yinji Lee, who is associate professor at Tokai University in Japan, and coordinator of the TBTI Japan Research Network, TBTI, too big to ignore, uh, and that refers to small-scale fisheries. Jack Kittinger, who is vice president for Blue Production, Global Fisheries and Aquaculture at Conservation International. And Paola Alvarez, Assistant Secretary at the Department of Finance of the Philippines. You're all very welcome. Now, the huge bulk of the world's fish catch is done by small scale coastal fisheries. And those fisheries employ by far the largest number of fisher folk. Uh, and that picture is really um, even stronger in the Asia Pacific region, uh, one dominated by small island uh, and coastal developing fisheries. The challenges around these fisheries are immense and we're going to touch on some of them uh, today. And they have to do with global subsidies, which harm stocks and uh, often harm uh, small scale fisheries. Um, they, they have to do with a sustainable fishery with livelihoods on land. This session will discuss life above the water as much as below the water and the links between the two. Um, and there are also indeed human rights issues around fisheries. And I think we're going to touch on those too. And perhaps uh, Jack, I could ask you just to lay out uh, the challenges and the, and the interconnectivities here uh, between small scale fisheries uh, and some of the problems uh, that, that loom over sustainability and more. Well, thank you, Dominic, for convening this panel and to my fellow panelists, who I look forward to learning from. The artisanal fishery sector has a disproportionate impact on food and livelihood security. It's often disregarded, however, and overlooked. Relative to the industrial sector, small scale fisheries catch two thirds roughly of the global fisheries volume that is destined for direct human consumption. And it employs nine out of 10 people in the fisheries sector, half of whom are women. So this is a vital sector for our global food and livelihood security. And it's absolutely critical for so many countries in the Asia Pacific region. This sector operates often alongside the industrial fleets of the world. And estimates show that of the Roughly $35 billion of global fishery subsidies provided, about 20% of that goes to the small scale fishing subsector, including artisanal and subsistence fisheries. That 80% goes to the industrial fleet. These fishing subsidies to the industrial fleet have been known to exacerbate inequalities between the large and small scale fishing sectors, which can have real tangible impacts on communities and countries. Uh, the vast majority of fishing carried out on the coasts of developing countries, including the Asia Pacific region, is often done by wealthy nations and distant water fishing nations fueled by these subsidies. This is both a threat, uh, but also an opportunity as the subsidy landscape continues to evolve and change. Uh, there are also threats associated with pollution, over harvesting, disease outbreaks, and other threats, and of course, climate change, which is something that the entire region is having to adapt to now. Well, well, thanks for that, Jack. And, and we'll, I think we're going to sort of tease out um, during the course of this conversation, uh, sort of solutions to a number of the, the, the challenges on subsidies, which you, which you highlight. Um, it's worth reminding people that there are negotiations at the WTO underway now. Um, a deal on subsidies, re heavily reducing the fish damaging uh, subsidies, um, has been elusive. It's been 20 years uh, of negotiations, but uh, let's hope uh, that, uh, that this time towards the end of the year, there will be uh, a sense of progress, because if there isn't, uh, there'll be precious few fish to talk about. Uh, Yinji, over to you. Could I ask you for your perspective and experience in terms of small scale fisheries in 
in Japan and your involvement with them. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, compared to those uh, in industrial and large-scale fisheries, uh, the small scale, the Japanese small-scale fisheries are not well known internationally. But um, like uh, about eighty percent of the Japanese fishers are engaged in small-scale and coastal fisheries, and about nine percent of them uh, are are family-run. So uh, these fisheries are scattered throughout the country and it forms the uh, Japanese coastal uh, landscapes as well. However, uh, small-scale fishery in Japan now facing many, many challenges. It, it, it includes uh, the um, lack of successors or um, the aging populations too, and then the losing community uh, vitalities, etc. cetera. So um, to, to the security uh, sustainable sustainability of Japanese small scale fisheries. I'd like to mention two uh, two key factors. One could would be uh, this blue justice because we uh, justice lens. Uh, recently, we had just a major uh, fisheries policy reform, which enables uh, this uh, huge private capital entering to uh, small-scale coastal fisheries. So there are the concerns that uh, small-scale fisheries are being marginalized uh, in this relevant policy. So we do need a justice lens now. And another uh, factor would be to, we need to increase this um, economic viability of the fishing communities through uh, many community businesses, which are run by the uh, small-scale fishers or the fishing communities. Yes, this, uh, these are the situations in Japan. Thank you. Well, well thank, thank you very much. And in a sense, perhaps that uh, centuries-old uh, traditions are, are under threat, communities that have been shaped precisely by their relationship with the sea. Uh, Sangram, India has a large number of small-scale uh, fishing communities. Um, and I'd love to ask you a bit about them and, and, and indeed how... Um, how the catch gets uh, to consumers. Um, but a backdrop here, is it not, is that there is also, uh, both Jack and Yinji have talked about industrial scale fishing. There's also plenty of uh, that in India. And indeed, you know, one of the stumbling blocks to a deal on subsidies in the WTO has not only been China, but also, so also India. Um, but I'd love to ask you about, you know, the challenges that India faces in terms of small scale fishing. Um, I, I, and you know wh wh where, where, um, where, and how do fisher folk feel the pain? Um, what's the role of the private sector? Because after all, you uh, are spearheading that with Pesca Fresh. Sure, Dominic. I think uh, it's extremely relevant to what you asked, and in line with what the other panelists discussed. So, India is actually has got three hundred three thousand eight hundred and twenty seven fishing villages in the remotest of parts of the coast, on the west coast and the east coast. We've got about 270,000 vessels. And typically, uh, I would say more than 95% would be labeled as a small scale fishery because they don't exceed more than 40 uh, meters or sorry, 20 meters in length. And then you have the smaller ones, which are about five meters and seven meters and eight meters. So what the challenge, uh, you know, I mean, we at uh, our uh, company about 14 years back, we've been trying to bridge that gap, trying to reduce that the supply chain links between the fishermen and the consumer. Uh, that's one of the things that we've been extremely active at. Uh, the biggest challenges are they're not... Uh, they're not financially inclusive. They don't have access to too much of loans. The education for those, uh, the, the, the children and the families, it's always uh, going to be extremely difficult for them because most of them are at a young age going on the boats and the vessels when they should be actually in educational institutions. Uh, the third uh, challenge is there is a lot of the, what, what we've heard, though I, of course I've not witnessed because I've not been in the deep oceans, that a lot of large scale fisheries from other countries, which have got these deep sea fishing trawlers are actually fishing off our waters. So that's a big challenge that our fishermen uh, face. And with rapid urbanization in India, uh, there, there is the, the coastal lands have really become very expensive or in, in terms of it's like prime real estate. So in those kind of things, uh, the small scale habitats are being disturbed since they fish very close by. So these are the few uh, challenges, you know, and uh, I think what needs to be done, we've always believed 
that uh, the the consumer has to uh, give more importance to small scale fishery and that's when they get more remunerated for their efforts apart from the subsidies kicking in for this community which is really disproportionate when it comes to the large scale fisheries so i think uh, the more awareness that we try to build with our brand so you have somebody who fishes for a day against somebody who fishes for 10 days and comes back there's a lot of there's a big difference in the freshness of the product and i think that's something which we try to communicate with our consumers so we can remunerate the small scale fisheries a lot better thank so you very much indeed so yeah yes yeah, so, so financial inclusive, inclusivity is is important and presumably that also means investment that does help uh yes. that does help fishers get uh, their catch to to market more broadly you 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 also mentioned uh subsidies uh, and and for those you know who are not intimately uh, familiar with the topic i mean and it's something perhaps we can talk about later um there is a direct connection between global subsidies and illegal uh unreported uh and um uh, are you you fishing um uh, unregulated fishing um it, because subsidies do uh, enable encourage incentivize um industrial fleets uh, to to break the law um paolo could i ask you for the government perspective i mean the philippines is an island nation heavily dependent uh upon the sea uh and on on seafood um living in a challenging environment uh climate change certainly um but also uh, certainly uh, to the to the northwest uh a south china sea that is heavily contested uh notably by china uh, where um it has been hard for philippine fisher folk um to uh, do their work but just tell us a bit about the government perspective and 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 your ministry's uh, perspective on uh, on all this including climate change and how that affects coastal communities Okay so thanks um just to give you a brief background so the department of finance of the philippines is now the chairman designate of the climate change commission and the reason for this is because climate change in the philippines cuts across all government sectors mainly it affects agriculture as well as socio economic development so just to give you some numbers the volume of fisheries production in the philippines in 2019 alone was 4.4 4.4 4.415 million metric tons and of this total 53.42% came from aquaculture 25.49% came from municipal fisheries and 21.10% were from commercial uh, fisheries out of this the around 21% of it comes from the Bangsamoro autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao and this area is home to four of the poorest or most impoverished provinces in the Philippines. So aside from the issues in terms of geopolitics, the Philippines is also ranked fourth in terms of climate hazards. So every year more typhoons uh, pass through the Philippines and this affects not only agriculture but everything across the government. So in 2021 alone in uh September of this year uh 850,000 jobs were lost in agriculture due to a super typhoon that passed the Philippines in 2020 alone in October and November we had back to back two super typhoons and this affected um inflation in terms of food and agriculture so uh the department of finance of the Philippines is very concerned about how the food security issue of the nation is affected in terms of fisheries because again as you said we are an island nation heavily dependent on fish production and a majority of our population are also engaged in the rural area so they are more into fishing communities and farming communities so this is an issue that we take seriously thank you very much indeed and 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 um, let's come back to some of these uh, topics during the course of the conversation um jack just to return to you uh, we we've talked about the links uh, between subsidies and illegal unreported and unregulated fishing um uh, what about human rights abuses because in particular in the asia pacific fishing fleets um it's becoming increasingly clear are sites uh, of um forced labor uh slave labor in effect um uh, and and other human rights um abuses uh, to to crews and not only to crews because fisheries observers uh are are also uh, regularly uh, uh found dead in in suspicious 
circumstances. Just tell us a bit about the human rights dimension, um, but also I'd like uh, to, to ask you uh, about Conservation International's work in the Pacific uh, in terms of coastal small-scale fisheries, just to give some examples of, uh, of improving work that can be done. Thank you, Dominic. I think it's fair to say that the human rights issues in the sector have really brought a new level of visibility to fisheries in general, starting in about five years ago when really it was journalists like yourself, Dominic, and many others in, in your line of work that sort of blew these issues open by reporting on severe human rights violations in the region. And uh, we now understand that the fishery sector may have among the worst performance records of any production sector on earth, uh, agriculture, mining, energy, et cetera. Uh, and this is a problem for the sector, the entire sector to deal with. And there are strong links between illegality with respect to the operations of a fleet, what we call IUU fishing, what people are licensed and permitted and allowed to catch and where they're allowed to fish and when, and the illegality associated with how uh, fishing enterprises, vessels are violating internationally agreed upon and domestically established legal norms for human rights. Uh, so this is a pervasive issue. And it's worth mentioning here also that the, um, the mechanisms of illegality for that, that impact the environmental sustainability of a fishery and the mechanisms that uh, drive human rights violations can be mutually reinforcing. So the, the need to harvest more, to, to meet price minimums can lead to abuse of folks on vessels, for example, and vice versa. So it's something the entire sector is trying to grapple with. And I think it's fair to say that this is something where the nonprofit and philanthropic sector uh, are partnering up with the, uh, the government authorities and the private sector, um, all of whom have a shared interest in rectifying these issues. Uh, CI, my organization, Conservation International, spent a lot of time working with our uh, fellow uh, uh, our fellow partners in other nonprofits and in the private sector to establish a globally agreed upon set of uh, framework principles for human rights. This is known as the Monterey Framework and it's been adopted by the Conservation Alliance for Seafood Solutions, a global consortium of private sector interests and nonprofits. And we are working to move that into, um, into practice. Um, far too slowly, but we're making great progress. And the ultimate aim of this is to make human rights due diligence the norm rather than the, than the exception in the sector. Uh, businesses do due diligence on all sorts of transactions and human rights due diligence is something that the international community has agreed upon as a standard of practice for all production sectors. The unique challenges of fisheries, of course, uh, create the impetus for us to adapt it when vessels are fishing far from shore under different sorts of conditions than we might have in the agriculture sector, for example. We have to adapt the ways that we do human rights due diligence. So we've done that now, and we're starting to see the adoption for that accelerate, which is great progress and, and one of the bright spots in this area. Thanks, Jack. Um, Yinji, just to, to, to ask you a, a bit about a bit more about your experience in, in Japan, how to change uh, practice on the water in communities um, and, and how to make sure that those communities' voices, including those of women, are heard. Now, Japan is uh, not famous as a, as a decentralized country. It's known for its top-down bureaucrat-led kind of governance. Uh, nor is it known for having large numbers of women in government either. So how to shift the course of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Japanese government ship, ship as it were, to, to uh, take into account uh, the local needs? Um, after all, it's local experience uh, and it's local communities who know their waters better than anyone. Yes, thank you, Dominic. Yes, um, let me mention uh, two things in here. <laughs> uh, one is about this blue justice that I have mentioned earlier a little bit. Yes, blue justice. Yes, the, um, 
the stakes have never been higher for the small scale fishers around the world. And that they face challenges such as uh, poverty, uh, food insecurity, gender inequality as well. And, uh, and more recently, uh, small scale fishers are being threatened by the, the blue economy, blue, blue growth initiatives. And um, while these initiatives may lack uh, unifying the, the definition, they, they, they have been criticized for, for um, this uh, being economic strategies that uh, prioritize economic um, efficiency and economic growth under, over the uh, sustainability. So we, we have, to, including Japan, we do need this uh, blue justice uh, uh, concept. This is the uh, concept that raised by the too big to ignore global partnership to um, criticize the, um, the blue economy and blue uh, growth initiatives. So uh, one is uh, that we need this um, to adopt this blue justice lens to look at the current situations that we face. And, and, uh, and, and women, and, 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 and in particular to emphasize the, the uh, the, the importance and, uh, uh, and role, indeed, security of women in uh, in the fishing industry? Yes, uh, the gender. Uh, for, first of all, I think we need to uh, raise this awareness of the uh, gender gap and gender issues uh, in the in the fishing fishing in industries. So, uh, so uh, to to do this. Um, Allow me to um, introduce our activities in, in this area. Uh, we, this TV, not too big to ignore Japan, we just launched uh, uh, this uh, gender equality, uh, gender equity um, program, uh, which is called the Girls Who Fish Japan program. And uh, this is um, inspired by the Canadian uh, Girls Who Fish program uh, run at the, at the Pity Harbor uh, called community called Pity Harbor in Newfoundland. And uh, yes, uh, this is to uh, engage uh, more women and girls into fish fisheries and fishing communities. So we now uh, gather once, uh, once a month uh, regularly and to uh, engage more uh, women and girls into fisheries. So this is to um, yeah the raised awareness. I think this is the first thing that we need to do now in Japan, especially in Japan. Yes, thank you. So, thank you, Yinjin. Thank you, uh, Sangram. Share some of your uh, your uh, business knowledge, your business skills. Um, I, I, it's it's with your business head on that I want to ask you a bit about uh, how to. Um, how to make small scale fisheries more vital uh, and uh, more more thriving um first of all the role of cooperatives how, you know is, is there scope uh, for having a more cooperative uh, approach after all that idea um is very well established in indian agriculture um secondly and you touched on this in your first remarks um access to investment access to finance the scope for fintech uh, how, how much can take place uh, in these areas to uh, improve small scale fisheries and get their product uh, to market in a sustainable, long lasting way? Yeah. So how it goes, uh, Dominic, is, uh, as, as you mentioned, you know, India is very predisposed to a cooperative uh, movement in terms of if you see we are one of the largest milk producers and due to this cooperative movement, there's a brand called Amul which is the largest brand in India, irrespective of all the multinational companies that come in. So a similar uh, concept like that must be introduced for uh, the Indian small-scale fishery because it's extremely challenging and extremely difficult for a single fisherman or a family of two or three to bring the produce on a remote fishing village and be remunerated adequately. But in case if there are 200 of them, and there's a there there is a movement that is bound strongly across the villages across the communities then they have a lot more selling power you know and they could get the right remuneration plus they could get their produce transported to a major urban city in india where they could be paid uh, more adequately rather than being more scattered so i feel the cooperative movement is something which the indian government uh, should look at uh, working out as a as a non profit just to bring everybody on the platform to make this happen. Uh, you know, one of the second parts is 
the the technological upgradation like uh, at this moment uh, our brand is uh, working with couple of uh, we are mentoring a few startups and i think india has a lot of uh, talent when it comes to technology and it's extremely affordable so initially we always viewed it like a show to door concept at the business but now we are going one step deeper where we want to make it like a sea to shore so it's like can you give the small scale fisheries echo uh, sounders fish finders gps so they don't stray in foreign waters can we allow them connectivity with the internet which is in a very basic way right now in the deep seas so that they are able to coordinate with their fellow fishermen and take the help in having better catches and bringing it to the shore early a uh, lot of these guys do not have access to finance for education finance to finance their fishing trips you know every time a, a trawler goes for fishing for 5 or 6 days and it's just like about a 40 foot trawler and they need to spend about 300000 rupees on it or 400000 rupees on it and if they don't catch anything it's just dead investment right the subsidies on the diesel and stuff are just not enough for these guys to sustain so it's it's a very hit and miss and that that kind of uncertainty and unpredictability must be uh, taken out of their business so they don't overreach they don't endanger themselves they don't float too deep in the waters they don't go fishing during the monsoons which is so risky and it is the breeding season but if you can't protect the livelihood for 8 uh, months of the year the the rest of the four months they are going to be end, ending up doing things just for survival uh, just to cover up uh, whatever costs that they have incurred so these are a few of uh, uh, challenges and these are some things which we feel is we work with startups and and uh, integrate them we're trying to build connectivity like it would be wonderful to get uh, to know about what the catch is and uh, give them certainty to the fishermen that yes we will buy it at this rate and this is the prevailing rate so uh, we would be able to transfer funds into their account even sometimes part of it before it comes to the shore so they have that financial inclusivity uh, you know a lot of data is missing what is found where and where can they fish and how much fish can they get and what's the price they can get so a lot of this thing can be solved by technology and that's i think where we should be headed and obviously the the, the cooperative movement and there are like 14 million people employed by the sector in the fishing sector in india and only 52 deep sea fishing vessels uh 270000 literally traditional vessels so these are a few things that uh, we would like to you know hopefully do and help with tech and fintech to give them access to a lot of things Th- thank you and, and so not only physical risk which is very real especially if you don't have gps yeah. uh, or or, or uh, other uh, equipment that increases safety but also investment risk uh, market risk and so on and I just would love to ask you Paula a, a bit about what you've heard uh, in in particular from Sangram here and whether the scope for the Philippine government uh to to think about um ways to to connect uh fisher folk fishing communities uh with end consumers is that a is that a um a legitimate uh, role for government is that something that government can be involved in Yes, definitely. Um just like what's happening in India, most of these things are also apparent in the Philippines. So the apparent issues, for example, is that a uh, 0.3% uh volume of fisheries decreased and a majority of this was from municipal waters and from aquaculture. And we also see that the uh uh commercial fishing has increased 5%. So in order to address these apparent issues the government came out with a national fisheries program that aims to address these types of issues. So first you again have the access to uh instruments that would help fisher folks for example because in the Philippines we're not as sophisticated as other countries. So we have very rural communities that engage in fishing. Second is your post harvest facilities that are available to your fishermen. So not a lot of the island groups have available post harvest facilities that could they they could access immediately and at the same time the transport of their produce from their uh, villages into the market is also a challenge so the government is looking into how do we appropriate enough funds for that but then again we also have the long term issues posed by climate change and as we have been seeing um we reconstituted our national panel of technical experts in 2021 to have members from the different islands that are signed 
scientists, practitioners, and members of state colleges and universities who work with rural communities. And we ask them to give us the top 10 climate-induced hazards that they see. And based on their experience, for example, in the Mindanao region, in Tawi-Tawi, a majority of the fishing communities there harvest um, seaweeds. So it's not just the biodiversity, but also the seaweeds within the waters. So an issue that they've been seeing is that due to the rising temperature of the seas, as well as the rising salinity in the water, a majority of the biodiversity is going down. So the amount of seaweeds that they are able to produce are declining, as well as the different types of fish that they could harvest are also declining. Because as your water temperature increases, the majority of the variety of fish that usually are the subject of fishermen's fish catch are actually going deeper into the oceans. That's why we have biodiversity loss as well. Aside from that, we have issues on coral bleaching, uh, coastal erosion. So these are things that we're looking into. So another issue that we see is that because of the coastal erosion, a majority of your salt water are now seeping into our freshwater sources. So you have lakes that are seem to have increasing salinity in them. So this also poses uh, an issue because, for example, milkfish or bangus and tilapia, which are the major sources of fishery livelihoods in the Philippines, are also grown in freshwater. So if you have your lakes, for example, and your other fish ponds having increased salinity in them, in the long run, this would also pose a problem. That's why the Climate Change Commission is now trying to address all of these issues in terms of a whole of government approach, but then what we have been communicating into the international uh, platforms, as well as in the COP26 that was recently held, is that developing countries such as the Philippines can't do this alone. That's why we need international cooperation, because the amount of finances that we need, not only in adaptation and mitigation costs, but as well as in terms of insurance to protect fisher folks who, have, who are the most exposed to climate-induced hazards, do not have access to insurance as well. So in terms of typhoons, in terms of other natural calamities, it's very hard for them to recover because if we provide insurance for them, the amount of premium would be increasing as well because they are highly exposed. So these are all factors that we take into consideration that we're now looking into um, how do we properly plan? How do we mobilize finance? And as the uh, other panelists were talking about, how could technology, fintech, and other innovation um, help us in terms of addressing these issues? Well, well, thank you, Paula. And, and you, you've raised the issue of uh, of uh, global financial uh, equity, the, the the need for richer countries to help. But you've also mm -hmm. highlighted um, issues of institutional capacity, and you pointed out, you know, that Mindanao, Bangsamoro, is mm -hmm. the poorest part of the Philippines in the far south. Um, actually, you know, financial help is 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 one aspect of it, but presumably being able to uh, actually, you know, execute change on the ground is 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 is, is another challenge. But mm -hmm. let's stick um, for the final round of our conversation here with, you know, with some actionables. Um, you know, would I, I and and certainly I and the audience too would I think love to hear about uh, measures and steps that uh, are being taken, uh, can be taken, uh, sh should be taken. And Jack, over to you. Please draw on uh, Conservation International's experience in the Pacific for, for, for this, but just a few a, a few thoughts and highlights about uh, a, a, about making change happen. I want to return to something that uh, my esteemed colleague. On the panel already discussed Sangram. Uh, we tend to think of fisheries as being very unique, but there is a heck of a lot to learn from other sectors like agriculture and other small scale producer communities. Um, and there are things that we can adopt from those sectors, whether they're cooperatives, which are essentially, you know, one form of governance that's been uh, highly productive uh, for small scale producers or technologies, which are often being developed first in agriculture and other sectors, and we can apply and adapt to the fishery sector. Fisheries are very unique. And, you know, it's the last thing we hunt, really, at scale on planet Earth, as a, and it's the most traded food commodity. The production mode is very unique. Uh, but we have a lot to learn from those sectors. So the small-scale fishery sector is not uh, immune to the scaling of solutions. And we've seen that happen 
in so many ways. There are two examples I'd like to point to. The first is marine protected areas. Uh, in many communities, and the Philippines is a great example of this, uh, the Philippines, uh, the communities across the Philippines have set up hundreds of marine protected areas to essentially protect that this, this gift of the ecosystem that provides all of this benefit to these communities nearly scot-free. Obviously, it takes investments uh, from the community, from governments, from producers, and often from, from partners. Uh, but protecting that asset base uh, is absolutely vital. And marine protected areas are a known proven tool and they really are, uh, you know, can be set up in such a way to provide direct fisheries benefits. Those are happening all across the region. We got to do more. The second Th thank thing- Thank you. Yes, very, very briefly, your second thing, Jack, oh, sure. our time is is short. So just, just a few seconds and, th and then we'll, we'll, uh, let, we'll, we'll let other panelists have their final oh, sure. say, but everybody brief, I'm afraid. I'll be very brief. And it's just that the, the nature of how the private sector gets involved and incentivizes production practices that are sustainable is absolutely catalytic. And that too is a key solution space. Thank you, Jack. Sangram, you've, you've highlighted some solutions around, uh, around fintech and, and, and more. Just, just give us a, a, a very brief uh, little final summary on, uh, on things that can be done. And, and indeed, I hope things that are already starting to be done. Sure. So I think first is uh, the technology must be subsidized by our local governments. Uh, we should allow them to access to the right vendors and make sure the installations are done at a, at a cost effective way. So these guys can adapt to that technology. There has to be a more of a holistic plan by the government in terms of uh, social and economic uh, integration because uh, life off the ground is very important for the fishermen uh, from the safety point of view. The harbors, as I think uh, uh, Paula did mention, they need to be upgraded uh, and they need to have dedicated spaces to keep the catch. They should have access to cold temperatures, chill temperatures, or even for freezing uh, on the harbor. And uh, uh, the, the last is what the private sector can do is create more awareness and uh, but keep part, profitable private enterprises must keep part of the budget of their CSR initiatives or corporate social responsibility initiatives towards the uh, small scale fishery. And they need to be also be given access to government uh, spends and budgets to create this awareness so consumers can pay top dollar to small scale fisheries. That's the only way they can sustain economically. And that's the only way we can conserve this kind of fishery. Thanking you. And I would just like to turn to Yinji for her final brief thoughts on, you know, her priorities and, 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 and actionables. Um, yes, um, uh, the, uh, we do need transdisciplinary approaches in, uh, in research as well as in governance. Uh, this is my <laughs> kind of conclusion. Because um, small scale fisheries governance is confronted with a kind of many weaker problems, uh, the problems that are hard to define and, uh, and the no stopping rules and all problems, problems are unique and the mistakes are, are costly. So we need, we must rely on, uh, on the collective judgments uh, with a lot of uh, the stakeholders to, to, to take part in and to have an inclusive uh, this governance system. Yes. Thank you, Yinji. Thank you. And, and, and Paola, just your final thoughts, uh, uh, either on things that you, you know, messages that you haven't been able to get out or on what you've heard from your yeah. fellow panelists. Yes, uh, thank you. So finally, just to give you a summary. So the Philippines sees this as a whole of government approach. So what we're trying to do now is to address the issues on the ground. So we want local governments to be empowered, to be educated, as well as the communities on how climate change affects their livelihood. So that's one of the things that we're doing. We're trying to come up with a revised national adaptation plan in order to address the different hazards that are specific to the different island states. At the same time, we're also mainstreaming sustainable and climate finance to engage the private sector as well as the international community on how we can mobilize financing, not just on the ground, but on the different sectors. So you have uh, sustainable financing in different forms of project finance. You have grants, you have subsidies, and you have investments. So we're trying to provide the policy environment to be able to mobilize these funding for us to better address the climate change issues, especially for those in biodiversity loss and agriculture. Well, thank you very much, and and uh, and th thank you to the whole panel. It, it has, for me, been a very interesting discussion, uh, one that started on the water, 
uh, and where some of the chief challenges, of course, uh, lie, um, and where there are solutions, uh, including uh, with marine protected areas, with better uh, GPS and other technology uh, on the water. But I think all of you also emphasize the importance of actions, uh, policies, um, and the like uh, on land too, in terms of inclusivity uh, and justice, in terms um, of, of uh, financial uh, tools and help, including fintech um, for fishing communities, um, and uh, indeed for you know the role of, of uh, government here as well as private sector uh, and society. So thank you all of you, Jack, Sangram, Yinji, uh, and Paula for this um, fascinating conversation. Um, it's been a, a, a real uh, honor to have you all. Thank you very much indeed. Um, our next session is uh, still on fishing, tools for trust and transparency. Uh, from me, Dominic Ziegler, uh, thank you and goodbye.